Father, we come before you thanking you for this great and mighty day, or a day when we can come into your house and worship you. Father, we give you praise. We shout hallelujah. Father, you lift up our souls. You have brought us up out of the pit of despair. Lord, hide me behind the cross that I might magnify your great and mighty name this morning. I ask in Jesus' name, amen and amen. Well, good morning. Uh, for those of you who are married, I want you to remember what your wedding day was like. Now, we would probably get various answers as to how that day went, um, especially from the bride anyway. Uh, she views her wedding day as something very special, right? That, that is her day. We've got this great picture uh, when April and I got married of me standing on the front steps of the church, and I've got this concerned look on my face. Now, I don't know exactly what was going through my head on that day, but it, it was a good day. I mean, wedding days are meant to be fun, right? They're, they're meant to be exciting. Uh, they're days of celebration. I suppose it probably depends on the part. Uh, my daughter's going to be getting married here pretty soon, and I, I don't know if that'll be a great day for me or not, but uh, it, it, it's a good day, and, and so it's, it's great joy. And it's, for the bride and groom, it's a day of anticipation. It's a day that they've longed for. Um, April and I are coming up on 28 years uh, this fall in just a few months. And she was like, what, about five years old when we got married, something like that. <laughs> um, and I, I want you guys to know, the night before our wedding night was the best night of sleep I have ever had in my entire life. The best night. Uh, haven't had much after that, but that night was the best night of sleep that I've ever had. I slept like a rock. And, and so the next day, there was a whole lot of excitement going on. You were trying to get ready. Uh, I was trying to relax as much as I possibly can, but, you know, I wanted to make sure. So I got to church a little bit early, trying to make sure everything was taken care of before we got. It was my home church, a little church not too far from where we live at right now. And so I couldn't wait to see her. We had actually decided a few days ahead of time to not see each other for at least a couple days. She ended up coming to my house the night before and I was up in my bedroom. I had a detached, I lived in a detached garage from our house. Uh, it was kind of my room and so uh, she came and was knocking on the door. She wanted to come in. I said, no, you, we, we're not doing this. You need, you need to go on home with, with your girlfriends. And uh, I got the best night of sleep and I don't know what they did all night long, but uh, we had decided not to see each other. So that day was an exciting day. I mean, we hadn't seen each other for a few days, and, you know, there's all this buildup for that, and I couldn't wait to see her. And so we get to the church, she's downstairs getting ready, and then the music plays. I'm standing up there with all my, you know, the best men, and her dad, I see him peeked around the corner, and he steps out, and then there she is, and it's like, wow, you know, that's the moment, right? When all of that excitement, and there's this beautiful girl that I get to spend the rest of my life with, standing there. Now, that, that didn't start that moment, right? That started years before, uh, almost to that very day when we got married. Uh, for us, it actually started out here at the square. Uh, you guys, I'm, I'm dating myself a little bit because I don't know if that's a thing anymore, but it used to be that all the teenagers would get together on a weekend on Friday and Saturday night, and we just Gas was cheap enough then. We could just drive around in circles, uh, you know, out the, out the square and pull over and talk to our friends then. And uh, I was out there driving around in, in bright, uh, fancy pickup truck. It was a red Chevrolet step side. And she was out there with her boyfriend. And she saw this guy, you know, she thought he was just everything in the world. And so she dropped her boyfriend off over at uh, Angelo's Pizza. <laughs> True story. She dropped him off at Angelo's Pizza and said, I'll be back in just a minute. And she came over and, and started talking to me. And, you know, it's just one of those moments. And she's like, oh, my gosh. And so she asked me to scoot over, and she jumped in my pickup truck, and we just drove around the square. And I don't know if we – did we ever pass your boyfriend maybe a few times? <laughs> she actually forgot him. She left the square forgetting that she had brought him with her, and I don't know how he got home. But that night, uh, something happened. 
And the next weekend, I called her, and I said, hey, would you like to go out in a week? And she said, yes. Now, you guys get this. It was two weeks before we got a date. Two weeks of anticipation. I, I made her wait two whole weeks. <laughs> and so all of that time, she's in, she was a junior in high school. I, I just graduated. She's in her classroom. You know how you girls are. You got your notebook there. And she's doodling. She's writing my name on her folder and, and daydreaming about this awesome guy that she gets to go out with here in a couple of weeks. And all of that is built up to the event that took place three years later at the altar when it all came to fruition. I, I, I bet you guys got some similar stories that you could probably... Now I've, I've overindulged that a little bit. But at some point in time, you guys were called together and a date was met, and there was a spark or something that happened. Maybe it was a shotgun. I don't know. Something got you all together, and it led to what is now that you have this, this wedding. There was a first date, and as, you got, as we got closer to each other and knew more about each other, we, we said, hey, I like her. She likes me. Uh, something is there, and before long, you're following each other around like a puppy on a string, Except there isn't any string and there's all this emotion and, and effort, the long nights, short days, and it builds up to when both of you decide, this is a, this is a good fit. This fit feels right. Let's make it permanent. And it, that day is longed for. It's anticipated. There's a lot of preparation goes into that. You guys know that. What you wear, uh, the food, the music, the flowers, everything is planned for until that day. And we come to this passage here, beloved. This is a day that is longed for. As the church, this is a day that we're living in anticipation of. We look at the world around us, and it's a crazy place, right? There are so many things that are happening today. And we're longing for this. 2,000 years has gone by since the advent of the church. We've, we've read 15 chapters in this letter that talk about the judgment that is coming. The, the saints are wanting this. What comes to mind when you think about heaven? Now, there's a lot of things that are popping in your head right now. Let me just speak to your heart right now. If those things are anything but Jesus, when you think about heaven, then we need to talk. Because heaven, even though there's a lot of great things there, is all about Jesus Christ. There's, we think about the streets go, we think about no more sin, no more death. All of these great things. I had a professor one time said that he wants to have a villa on the outside of Italy. And, and that sounds great, but that's not heaven, okay? On your wedding day, there's a lot of great things that happen. And I'm sure those of you who are married, you weren't thinking about the cake. You weren't thinking about the people that were going to be in the pews. You weren't thinking about all this other stuff. What you were thinking about was the one you get to be with. And that's what heaven is all about. That's what this day is all about. It's about the one we get to be with. Now, don't get me wrong. I love this life. I, I love all the great things that I get to do. I, I'm, I'm so blessed, as I know some of you are. We get to work. We get to play. We get to do all these great things. And a lot of that stuff keeps us busy, doesn't it? But all of this stuff that's around us, it's temporary. It, it's, it's a, fa a facade. It, it's all fading array, away. It's, it's in a process of decay. There's sinful nature all around us. And so the church, if we're in the right frame of mind, if we're mature, we understand this is the day that's coming when we finally get to be in glory with Christ celebrating. And to some extent, we, in this country, it, it, it's a blessing and a curse. We're so blessed to have the freedom and the liberty to go and come as we please. But with all that freedom, a lot of times we tend to take things for granted. Why were we made? We're made to worship God. That, that, that's our purpose. And we can do all this other stuff. And in reality, we're just kind of spinning our wheels if we're not focused on Him. You guys ever get tired of the rat way? You ever get tired of waking up morning after morning and and your back aches, and your feet hurt, and all of this stuff is, 
is going up, the bills are piling up, you're trying to figure out what, which problem to tackle first. And again, it's not to say that we don't love this life. You don't love your husband or your wife or your children or family and friends, but there's more than all of this. There's so much more, and all of it revolves around him. He is our final destination. He is total peace. He's absolute security. So we don't have to worry about all this if we're focused on him because he promises to take care of us. That's what heaven is all about. It's all about Jesus. And so when we look at our text, the picture that John portrays for us here is overwhelming. We really get into this. He's just witnessed the fall of an apostate church. Babylon the Great has been taken down. It's been destroyed. Judgment has came to an unrepentant world. All of heaven now is praising God. They're shouting, as we just did, Hallelujah! Hallelujah to the King! Hallelujah to this God who, who's been patient, who's brought salvation. The greatest gift that we've ever had, beloved, is salvation in Jesus Christ. He didn't have to do that. He did not have to save you. He doesn't have to offer that. We deserve so much worse. We deserve His wrath. But if He hadn't did that, that's exactly where we'd be. We'd be under judgment with all of the rest that we've been reading through. And so God is praised for His power. He's praised for His glory. He's praised for salvation. He's praised for His justice. All of those things belong to Him, you see, because it's only through the awesome power of our Lord Jesus Christ that we can be saved from sin. That we can be forgiven and, and made new. That's what the cross and the resurrection is all about. The saints are in a position of praise because of God's grace. Because He saved us. And He's brought us into safety. God, God is praised for His judgment on the wicked. We, we see here in our passage, the, the last, it's been a few weeks ago, but in chapter 14, six, or 17 and 18, He judged Babylon. In one hour, that city fell. And it was destroyed. Men are, are running all over the place. And it was destroyed because it was leading them astray. The curse that, that is coming to an end, we see in this passage. The worst thing about Babylon, beloved, it, was it led people from the truth. It kept them from salvation. All these things that are going on in the world today, that are sidelines and sidetracks that hold us back, it keeps us from living our true purpose, which is... To serve and worship God. All of that ends right here in this passage with the fall of Babylon. Babylon has been destroyed. And for that it's being judged. It's, it's never going to be seen again. And so God is going to have to deal with the great deceiver. We're going to see that here in a few weeks. But man's part in it, God is dealing with right now. So God is praised for ushering in His kingdom. The wedding day is here. Everything that is anticipated in the church is found here. And so we can rejoice. We can be glad. All of the planning, all the preparation, all the anticipation is finally coming to what it was meant to be. Whatever was started on the cross of Calvary is completed in the consummation of the wedding supper. You guys understand what we're looking at? This is a great day. We're anticipating this day. It's an awesome day. It's a new day because from this point on, start something totally new. A millennial reign. To what the Jews had been longing for. Remember when we talked about Jesus coming riding into Jerusalem? He was on the back of the donkey. And, and what were they singing? Hosanna. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. What were they looking forward to? They were looking for the king that was coming in to start anew. He was going to start reigning. He was going to kick out all the government. He was going to take off and, and rule things in a righteous way. Now, they were longing for that. They were looking for that, but their timing is off. Because there's a lot of things that had to play, take place before that. Before he comes to reign in power, he has to redeem me and you. If he doesn't die on a cross, then sin's not defeated. The grave is not defeated. So he has to go to that place first. He has to defeat Death and sin by rising from the grave so that one day we can too have resurrected bodies. He also had to go away so he could send the Holy Spirit. So he could write it upon our heart. 
So he can indwell us with power from on high so that we, as he prayed in John chapter 17, would have union with him and the Father. None of that happens if he does not go to the cross. He can't sanctify us. And he continues that even to this very day. What we're looking at today is a day that all the church, all of the Old Testament saints, all of them look forward to since the very beginning. A day when everything will be made right as Jesus takes his rightful place as the ruler over all of creation. The Lord is welcomed in his church. He's, he's brought us together with him. We're dwelling in his presence. We've been made new. We're transformed. We're seen here in this passage as blameless. Notice the transformation process that takes place in here. Verse 8, fine linens, bright and clean, were given to her to wear. Fine linens, uh, John writes in uh, the, the text below that those stand for the righteous acts of the saints. How many of you like to go shopping? Some of you are shaking your head, yeah. Most of the ladies, most of the guys are probably saying, no, I, I, I can pass. Um, when, when we first got together, April and I, we were dating, and then right when we got married, we had a little money because we didn't have any kids at the time. And, and so we would go to the mall in Lexington. She loved to go shopping, and I went just because she wanted to be there. And she liked to go into uh, the department stores up there and get tennis shoes. Tennis shoes, especially Nikes. Nikes was her thing then. And so we would buy the newest pair of Nikes so that she could cover her pretty little feet in victory. Nikes means victory, right? So she wanted to put Nikes on her feet, and we always got the newest pair. And after that, as a reward for me going with her, I, I got to go into the outdoor section of Dick's or some other sporting goods store. And, uh, you know, I could spend hours in Cabela's right now just walking around looking at stuff. Uh, and, and so this is about being clothed in something new. On a wedding day for the bride, what's the wedding day all about? Ladies? The dress. It's all about the dress. The dress has to be something special, right? Now, guys, we're not going to get this as much because, the, you know, the ladies understand this. The dress is it. But here in our passage, what it says here is that Christ is imparting his righteousness to the church. We don't have any righteousness in and of ourselves. Even, Paul says, even all the things that I do, even the good things that I do, they're nothing but filthy rags. So what Jesus does is he clothes his bride, the church, because it's all about him. See, beloved, he's, he's making us new. We got a few stains on us. We got a few, how did those things happen? And so Jesus, the perfecter of our faith, as the Hebrews tells us, He's going to clothe his church in righteousness. This is actually the ultimate Cinderella story. Before Disney ever thought about putting it in movie feature, this is the Cinderella story. He is the hero. Jesus is all it is. He's the one who perfected and, and makes it right. He's the one who comes in and cleans up all our mess. This is nothing about us, but it's all about him. And because of that, he wants us to be with him, and so he's going to give us nothing but his best. And so he gives us something from himself. He gives us his grace. He gives us his mercy. He clothes us in righteousness. And he, do, he does this because he wants the church to be with him. You guys remember in the Genesis story, Adam is taken and put asleep, and God takes part of his rib so that he can make Eve? That's kind of what this is like. Christ is giving us part of himself. He, he wants the church to be with him, to make us glorious. He, he's given us the spirit, and now we're clothed in his splendor. And we're made new. Do y'all feel glorious right now? Pro probably not, right? Because we're still stuck here dealing with all the stuff that's going on. But when we're here in this particular text, when we get to be with him, we will be glorious. We will be clothed in his righteousness because, again, he gives us part of himself. And that, that act then inaugurates this feast, the, the wedding supper of the Lamb. Now, every good wedding has a feast, right? You've got to sit down and have a meal. 
Jewish tradition, they celebrated the feast. Sometimes that would last for days. It depended upon the wealth. Our God is a rich, wealthy God. He, he's wrapped in splendor. And so in the Jewish tradition, sometimes this would last for days and days and days. It's a big thing. They bring out the food, the drink, the laughing, the dancing. All of this happened. You guys may remember the first miracle that Jesus did. Where did that happen at? It was at a wedding. And it had lasted for some time, so much so, that they ran out of wine. And so what did he have to do? They brought in the water. He changed it to wine. And the, you know, the, the host said, hey, you got to save the best stuff for last, you know. And so this feast that's happening, you know, it, it's all about the celebration. God is having a big party and he's going to invite everybody. We're celebrating the king. We're celebrating what he did and who he is. The angel tells John here, write this down. That means this must be important, right? If he's writing all this down anyway, and then he tells him, make sure you write this part down, John. And he says here, blessed are those who are invited. Invited to the wedding supper of the Lamb. Did you get that, church? This meal is by invitation only. You have to be invited. The invitation comes out in the gospel message. You only get to be here if you're invited from the King of Glory. Now here's, here's the good news. I have been called and commissioned by the King himself to be a messenger. And so I am inviting all of you right now, if you haven't been invited already, to the supper. You have the invitation, okay? I'm asking you to come. What you have to do now is accept. You have to say, yes, I want to come to the wedding supper of the Lamb. I want to be with Jesus because that's what heaven is all about. I want my sins forgiven. And so I'm going to trust in Him. I'm going to confess in my mouth that, yes, I am a sinner and I am in need of a Savior and Jesus is that Savior. I believe everything that the Bible says about Him. And I'm, I want to put my trust in Him. You just repent and you believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. And the Bible says then, you will be saved. Now that, 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 that's it. That's the gospel in a nutshell. Right there. That's when Christ comes into your life and He begins to do the work that He wants to happen. He begins to mold you and change you. You guys may remember a story from Matthew chapter 22. Jesus is telling a parable. He talks about this wedding that the king is having. And the king invites all of his servants to come into the wedding. And what, is, what happens is he goes out and he says, Hey, invite everybody to come to the wedding. And they, they all have excuses. They're all doing other things. And they say, Well, we can't go. And so he sends out more servants. And they, they, they slaughter those guys. And so he tells some of the other servants, he says, go out and don't tell those people who, who are supposed to be here. Go out and tell everybody else. Just find them in the gutter, down in the streets, wherever you can, and bring them into the supper. Now what happens then when you came to a supper at the king's house is he gave you new clothes. Because you couldn't be in the king's house wearing rags, right? You guys know if you go into a fine restaurant now, they, they got a dress code. Sometimes you have a tie, sometimes you have to have a dress coat. And sometimes if you don't have those things, they provide those things for you. You come in, they got like a closet back there, and you need a dress coat on, they get you a dress coat. It doesn't matter if you're wearing a polo or a t-shirt or whatever underneath, you just got to have the dress, the dress coat on. And so the king would provide the clothing. Christ is providing the clothing. He's already said he's given fine linen and bright clean, was given her the church to wear. You accept Christ, He gives you the clothing. But you got to put it on. In that story, what happens is there's one man, and you may think this is pretty harsh, that one man comes in, I don't want to wear the clothes. I refuse to honor the king in that way. And that man is escorted out of the feast. He's excluded from the feast. But everybody else who's there have a place at the table. They've all believed, they're all trusting, and they're all, for that matter, now saved. They're given new clothes, they're welcomed in to the table to enjoy the bounty of glory. 
See, Jesus is providing everything that we need. He's providing something good, something better that we cannot get on our own. There's a world out there, beloved, it's trying to entice you. It's trying to get you away. It's trying to get your attention. The enemy he tries to do all sorts of things to, to draw us away and cause us not to, to, to focus on Christ. All of those things pale in comparison. We have an invitation. There's something more that is waiting for us. And today we're living in anticipation. Now, I know tomorrow there's supposed to be a big event. I don't know if you haven't heard, if you had your head stuck in the sand, you know that there's an there's a eclipse happening. And there's been some folks saying that Jesus is coming back tomorrow. Well, if he is, amen. Mm-hmm. Okay? I'm ready. But if he doesn't, that's not a big deal. Okay? The Bible does say that there will be signs in the heavens. There's all these sorts of things. There's been earthquakes happening. There's been wars and rumors of wars. We've talked about all these things. God will come back when he's good and ready. Right now he's being patient. And he's giving everybody who has not accepted him plenty of time so there is no excuse. The invitation is out there. I've just presented it. If you have not trusted in Christ, let today be the day. Will you please stand as we sing? Have you been to Jesus for the cleansing power? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Been washed in the blood of the Lamb. I pray that you have. I pray that today is a good day for you guys. I pray that you go out of here and, and God just blesses you today. We're already blessed. The sun is shining today. It's going to be a lot warmer than it has been in the last few days. Amen that i pray god gives you an opportunity uh, to share his grace in this message with somebody else and that his face is smiling upon you